Welcome to Cardiac Delusions. Let's see our quote today. Intermittent pre-excitation is a sign of a low risk accessory pathway. Is that true or false? An 18 year old male patient presented to the clinic by intermittent episodes of palpitation at rest of one month's duration. He had an ECG today which was completely normal, but he had an ECG one week ago that showed evidence of manifest pre-excitation as evidenced by the short PR interval, delta wave and Y complex. The senior in the clinic suggested that this is an intermittent pre-excitation and so it is a low risk accessory pathway and so he decided that there is no need for any medication. But the problem is that one week later this patient came to the ER by evidence of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So how come this patient is having a low risk accessory pathway and he develops pre-excited AF? Or the question should be, is intermittent pre-excitation an evidence for a low risk accessory pathway? Manifest pre-excitation, which is also called Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern, is characterized by presence of an accessory pathway that conducts rapidly from the atrium to the ventricle as it penetrates the AV ring. If an impulse passes entirely through the AV node, it results in narrow complex. If it passes entirely through the accessory pathway, it results in wide complex. But if it passes through both the AV node and accessory pathway, this results in fusion beat due to conduction via both. AV node and accessory pathway. This explains the short PR interval and then the delta wave with the slurring in the complex as the PEEP transits from the conduction through the accessory pathway to the AV node. And so we have three features for manifest pre excitation which are short PR interval, delta wave, and Y complex. We need to know that most patients with asymptomatic manifest pre excitation will go through life without any related clinical events. But one in five patients will develop an arrhythmia related to the accessory pathway during follow-up, like AVRT in 80% of the cases and atrial fibrillation in 20-30% of the cases, which is here called pre-excited AF, and it may degenerate into VF resulting in sudden cardiac death. And so the risk of VF here has been estimated at 2.4 per 1,000 person per year. This indicates that some patient are considered to be at high risk. In patients with manifest pre-excitation, sometimes the impulse may pass entirely through the AV node despite the presence of accessory pathway and despite that sometimes it reveals anti-grade conduction. And so this results in our complex with absence of pre-excitation pattern in ECG and this indicates intermittent pre-excitation. We don't call it here concealed accessory pathway because here we can see some evidence of anti-grade conduction over this accessory pathway in some ECGs and in other ECGs it is completely normal ECG. So what does intermittent pre-excitation signify? We used to think that intermittent pre-excitation indicates an intermittent conduction in the accessory pathway, so it is a weak or a low-risk accessory pathway. But the truth is that it indicates strong AV conduction rather than a weak accessory pathway, as here the AV node intermittently predominates the accessory pathway. So when the accessory pathway shows shorter effective refractory periods than the AV node, it results in Y complex with the presence of delta wave and short PR interval, while when the AV nodes show shorter effective refractory periods than the accessory pathway, we usually abbreviated as ERP, it showed evidence of normal PR interval and normal complex duration without evidence of pre-excitation. So this indicates intermittent pre-excitation and that's why it is usually seen in young individuals as they show strong AV nodal conduction. So as we mentioned here, intermittent pre-excitation does not signify a risk access to pathway or decide for conservative treatment rather than an EP study. That's why the 2019 AC guidelines for management of SVT decided that if a patient is having symptomatic manifest pre-excitation in the form of AVRT, this patient has a class 1 to go for catheter ablation for the accessory pathway regardless it is intermittent or persistent pre-excitation. So if we come back to our patient, he should go for elective catheter ablation rather than conservative treatment just based on the notion that he has intermittent pre-excitation. But what if the patient is having asymptomatic pre-excitation? Is the management different? There is a class 1 indication to perform an EP study using isoprenaline for 
patients with asymptomatic pre-excitation who have high risk occupation or hobbies like pilots or those participating in competitive sports and this class 2a to risk stratify those individuals in general regardless their occupations hobbies or participation exercise and according to the results of the ap study catheter ablation is indicated even if the patient is asymptomatic is if having shortest pre-excited RR interval during atrial fibrillation to be less than 250 milliseconds or equal, accessory pathway ERP less than or equal to 150, there is evidence of multiple accessory pathway or inducible accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. So this indicates that any patient with asymptomatic manifest pre-excitation should undergo an invasive EP study to perform risk stratification and measure the ERP and shortest pre-excited RR interval. But regarding the non-invasive evaluation of the conducting properties of accessory pathway, it has a class to be. This indicates a weak evidence. For example, performing ampullatory ECG monitoring to detect intermittent pre-excitation or treadmill test to check the disappearance of the manifest pre-excitation with exercise. So why is the evidence for these non-invasive tests so weak that it has a class 2B? If we speak about treadmill tests in those patients during exercise, the increasing catecholamines will increase the sinus rate and also enhance the conduction through the accessory pathway and AV nodes, and so resulting in varying degrees of pre-excitation on the surface ECG with exercise. That's why the abrupt loss of pre-excitation during exercise has been shown to correlate with long accessory pathway ERP, and so indicating a low-risk accessory pathway. But the problem is that if the pre-excitation is subtle but it is still persistent or gradually decreasing with faster sinus rate, here the utility for risk stratification is limited and here the accessory pathway may be strong and high risk despite it is not completely evident with exercise. Regarding serial ECGs and ampullatory ECGs, those showing intermittent pre-excitation have been assumed to have long anti-grade ERP and so lower risk of sudden cardiac deaths due to intermittent loss of anti-grade conduction through the accessory pathway during sinus rhythm. But the problem is that intermittent pre-excitation is not always due to low risk accessory pathway. It may be due to acceleration dependent block, we call it phase 3 block which is phase 3 of the action potential or impulse reaching during the phase of slow diastolic depolarization we call it phase 4 block or enhanced AV conduction as we mentioned at the start and the shorter AV nodes anti-grade ERP. So the utility also of serial ECGs and ampullatory ECG for risk stratification is still limited. And this clinical study performed in 2016 to assess intermittent versus persistent pre-excitation in children. You can find the link for this reference in the description of the video below. They studied 295 patients who included those with persistent pre-excitation, with intermittent or with loss of pre-excitation in halter or exercise. The result is that there were no significant difference in symptoms between the three groups and with AP studies there was no difference in the frequency of high risk pathway. But with the use of isoprenaline, the high-risk pathways were more frequent among patients with loss of pre-excitation on halter and exercise with a significant p-value, and so indicating that those with loss of pre-excitation still have high-risk pathway, even sometimes they may be higher risk than those with persistent or intermittent, according to the study, and there was one death in a patient with loss of pre-excitation or exercise testing and with no EP study or prior drug use. Moreover, in multiple recent studies which included both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, nearly 20%, which is a large percentage of patients with intermittent pre-excitation, have an accessory pathway ERP less than 250 millisecond, indicating high risk accessory pathway despite being intermittent on ECG. So if our patient was completely asymptomatic and having intermittent pre-excitation, we need to go for an invasive EP study for risk stratification in order to assess whether this accessory pathway need ablation or not. So the conclusion that while intermittent pre-excitation may confer a lower risk of sudden cardiac deaths, we should not be deceived and it does not indicate no risk to the patient. Sometimes it may be intermittent pre-excitation and it is a high risk 
accessory pathway as evidenced by the EP study. So if someone told you that intermittent pre-excitation is a sign of low risk accessory pathway, please tell him this is completely wrong and intermittent pre-excitation is an imperfect marker of a low risk accessory pathway and so EP study is needed to perform risk stratification even in asymptomatic patients. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait for the next video in cardiac delusions.